Yeah, we are going to move ahead. I want to show you some fabulous examples from other communities about how you can create places in, from the very smallest scale to the very largest, thinking about institutional partners, you know, and what public spaces really are um, in terms of all the different opportunities for partnering and community building, etc. And then we will break for lunch, and then we will have our get ready for our outdoor walk around post lunch. Instead of falling asleep, we're going to take you outside to get a little bit uh, more exercise. So, can someone, and I'm going to go back to Twitter, so I'm not ignoring it. Yeah, can someone dim the lights if, if it's possible a little bit? So, we, we picked this slide because um, this is in Houston, Texas, in Discovery Green Park. And this is a sort of luminaria project. Um, and these are illuminated balloons, like light balloons at night. And there's another image where there's actually photographs of people's faces on them. So, we know that you have a wonderful light installation. Um, art project coming to a park near you in May, um, at the end of May. So we wanted to kind of, we wanted to sprinkle in some of these ideas about, about luminescent art um, as a way of creating that gateway, that landmark, as well as providing illumination. So this is in, in texture. Okay, this is a very pixelated picture. All right, so what is placemaking? Um, it's called, a, it's more like, it's not a design, it's a movement. This is a campaign. Well, there's a campaign, which is different. This is a movement, a global movement, um, that basically works with people to collectively reimagine and reinvent public spaces. So our firm helps communities create the public spaces that sustain community life. Because we all think about the public spaces that we support through our tax dollars, through um, institutions, etc that really belong to us. So we really create, we start with the development, we look at the public space around the building before we design the building. When we, So it's, it's all about really the public realm, um, but it's really looking at community assets and creativity and inspiration and talking to and getting input from and working with the people that live, work, go to school, run businesses, in a community. You know Isla Vista better than we ever will. We have been here not even 24 hours. So we are not here to tell you what to do at all. We don't have a clue what we should, what you should do. Actually, we have some suggestions from other places, but we're here to facilitate a conversation and to, to, to pull out all this amazing intelligence and knowledge and experience that you all have to help address the challenges that you're facing. Um, so, usually architects, designers, they never really talk to the community, but you have a lot of answers. You know, you have solutions to things, but no one's ever asked you, um, or they ask you too late. So we come in and we talk to you first, because it, it just, I'll just describe why, but it's a much better, and that's kind of that place governance idea, where the community's wisdom and knowledge is actually is respected and valued, and actually elevated, um, and is like a key resource. To the whole process. Uh, so it's not a profession, it's not a discipline, it's really hard to describe, um, but it, it uses the best knowledge and experience of professionals and designers and engineers and, um, and folks like that to basically support and capitalize upon the local knowledge assets and ideas to create these shared, shared public space because it's this idea of the shared value of the public realm that we want to talk about, the shared value of a train station, the shared value of a park, um, or, or, or of a plaza, or a library. I mean, that's really where our capital is, our place capital, the value of those, of those institutions and those places to sort of build that shared value of the public realm. And we look at improving the quality of public spaces and the lives of residents. So we're always thinking about the built environment. We're thinking about physical spaces. And, when a gentleman said, you know, this is harder than it seems. You know, this is your community. You're supposed to know where everything is, you know, but it's, it's that idea of how do you go from ideas to actually spatial applications and the built environment. It's not just starting with, with the buildings, but it's really looking at, so that's what we'll be showing, is, is we started to have you put dots on. It's about connecting these ideas to the physical spaces, and that's how we kind of do that, that transfer, that make that translation. Um, to design. So where have we have worked? We have been around. I will have been at Project for Public Spaces in October for 25 years. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. 
They haven't fired me yet. It's amazing. <laughs> really amazing. Um, and so we work squares, parks, public buildings, campuses, downtowns, libraries, museums, um, all over the country, all over the world. Um, we, I run a wonderful program for the National Endowment for the Arts. It's called the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. And um, we provide technical workshops to six communities a year that are facing a design challenge. So this kind of a workshop that we're doing with you is very much what the National Endowment for the Arts funds us to do because there are very few technical assistance programs offered by the federal government. USDA will give you $20 million to build a new sewage treatment plant, which is much bigger than you really need, but they're not gonna tell you where to put it or how to run it. They will give you money to build a new fire station, but if it's 20 miles out of town, because that's where the farmer sold you the land, they're not gonna tell you that's too far away. They just don't provide technical assistance. They give you a lot of money. So we provide very little money, but a lot of technical assistance. <laughs> so um, you have to be a town of under 50,000. And we just had the last round um, of, can you, we didn't get any applications from California this year. So to think about that for smaller communities. So we do work in small towns, rural communities. We have some towns like 817 people um, we're working with them. I also run a program for the Southwest Airlines. It's the heart of the community. Southwest Airlines is in the place-making public space business. Um, they are investing in creating great public spaces in all the cities that they serve, which is over 90. So we've done 13 cities with Southwest Airlines over the last um, three years. And it's on our website, pps.org. Then it's heart hyphen of hyphen the hyphen community. Um, so that's kind of a thought leadership piece for Southwest Airlines in terms of connecting people to places. That's what they do, they're an airline. And then we wanna make sure that those places are worth going to. So um, yeah, they don't fly here. Yeah. But I uh, know, um, but it's still that idea that there's, we're a staff, we've also had support from Redbox and we're just a staff and like the corporate world is kind of getting, but not, but in a very, in a very positive way in terms of corporate CSR and thought leadership. So the value of, of investing, very exciting. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit, yes. You mind if I interrupt you just for sure. a second? As Cynthia is going through this wonderful presentation, which will tell you a lot about Project for Public Spaces, if you feel like tweeting, our PPS handle is PPS underscore placemaking. You should be able to find us. And Cynthia's hand, Twitter handle is at the right Cynthia Nikitin. You can find her. And our hashtag for today is PlaceIV. So everybody, if you feel the need. Thank you. Continue, please. But you have to pay attention to everything I say because there will be a quiz. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, this is a wonderful example of kind of how cities are. So we have this situation where this is just a street and you've got the cyclists and you've got the motorists and the pedestrians and they're all fighting for street space. And uh, we also run the Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place Conference, which is happening in Vancouver. And it used to be called Pro Walk. Provide. And the idea was to get pedestrians and cyclists to actually talk to each other. Um, cyclists have like groups and teams and pedestrians, we don't really have any lobbies, we just walk. So you, cities like, you know, transportation, they like pedestrians and bicycle, bicyclists to fight over that five foot space, you know, where the car gets a 15 foot lane, you know. So we're like, no, it's, it's the car has to the pedestrians and bicyclists win. So here you have just the situation and you're like, these people are trying to bike and the woman is very angry at them. You've got politicians making decisions, public administration, the private sector. And they're kind of like always going after where's the capital, where's the funding, what's the silver bullet? And it's this very sort of short, contentious, competitive cycle. And it's kind of, a, it's kind of competing to the bottom rather than competing to the top. So how this plays out in a design and planning process um, is there's a problem that's identified or a project that has to happen or it's a legacy project that a, a mayor or a city manager wants to see through. And then what are, the, what are the problems with getting that done? What are the issues that are in the way? What are the challenges? How do we design to avoid that? How do we evaluate that? How do we mitigate? Um, and you kind of then you get it sort of designed and, and built. But 
what happens is you're always starting with this problem or this, and then how do we manage the problem? So people come into a plan and they're like, okay, we are going to redesign your park or we're going to build a convention center or an aquarium um, or something. And what do you think of this design? And they say, why are people always so angry at community meetings? You know, why we just, they, we just want that we're 60% design, why don't they just say yes? And it's because the community is brought in too late and they are brought in too late to give opinions on the solution to a problem they had no role in defining. So you think this roadway needs to be wide, right? For whatever, I don't think it needs to be wide. And I think it needs to be narrowed. I want my kids to be able to walk to school or I want to be able to pull out of my driveway easily or I want to be able to talk to my neighbors without hearing too much traffic noise. Um, so that's, what it, that's kind of what it is. So these projects are very long-term, very expensive narrow goals, often crisis driven in response to something. Um, community meetings are not wonderful. They're often expensive because the way that they're done, there's no opportunity to think about cost savings or leveraging. Um, and very much so that if you design a park without talking to the people that you think you're gonna use it, no one's gonna use it. So all this, they did this in colleagues in Johannesburg, South Africa, beautifully designed park, no one's in it. They never talked to the neighbors, they never found out who lived there. They just had this beautiful design. We think this is what people are going to want to do. We like to go in and say, what would you like to do? And then we will design it for you. The community is the client. You are the client. These projects, you they are they are, should be done not just to you and for you, but with you and by you. So and it doesn't always happen. So this collaborative place governance sort of diagram is where politics, community members, public service all work together looking at increasing the value of the public realm, creating a shared vision of, of place. A lot of this is based on trust and transparency, which doesn't exist in every city and certainly not in the governments of every country that we work for, but it's a way of starting to build that that trust and that transparency, because without it, it's very hard to get anything really accomplished. Um, so, but it's also about partnerships and collaborations. And we always say you can't do it alone and you shouldn't do it alone. So it's really that. So this is kind of our process, uh, where you start not with the problem or the project, but the place. Let's define the place. Let's identify the stakeholders, the interested parties, our potential partners. Um, and then before we go out and design something, let's figure out how it's working. What's, what is successful about it? What are the problems? It's like going to the doctor and say, I need an operation. I need surgery. And the physician will say, well, what's wrong with you? I don't know. I just need an, I know I need an operation. <laughs> you know, I just, just do it. You know, this is like, I have to redesign this place. Well, what's wrong with it? Why? Well, I don't know. It just needs, it, you know, sprucing up. It needs a new design. So we like to look at how it actually functions. So that's what we're gonna be doing this afternoon is actually doing some evaluation of some key public spaces and then coming back and coming up with a vision for how to improve them in the short term as well as the long term. We are all about short term improvements, experiments. We are all about figuring, like we were walking around yesterday and it was, it was amazing. We were walking on these really hard packed dirt paths you know, through the parks. And this was great because this is where people want to go. And this was the shortcut to the elementary school. And it's like, great, if you were going to then actually do paths, that's where you put, you know, the stone. That's where people want to go. So you experiment to see what people want to do before you make it permanent. Like in Harvard, where we had the beanbag chairs versus the very expensive, you know, benches that people weren't using. So we like to talk about lighter, quicker, cheaper. We'll talk about that in the next couple of days. And then you're always looking how you can make it better. And you've got some great public spaces and a lot of you were talking about what you could add to that, how you could make that better. In this case, the communities are empowered because you are sort of throughout this entire process, um, attract other partners, unlikely partners, people that can support this idea. Solutions are flexible because at the end of the day, these public spaces, they belong to you all and you need to kind of take care of them. So when you have a stakeholder meeting, Everyone in that room is potentially a steward of that place, a partner in helping it be implemented, a partner in helping to take care of it, or to fund it, or at least to promote it. 
So that's why we like to get a lot of people um, in the door. So stakeholders advise, bring additional resources, implement, and the experts, as I've said before, we inform, we facilitate, um, we help to design, but we're basically in service to the community and the shared vision that we hope we help you come together. Not everything is 100% consensus, but at least there's some, some key items that people want to move forward with. So this is another way of looking at it. The traditional planning, you've got this you know, kind of process, design, maybe people use it, maybe they don't. And with placemaking, it's very iterative. You know, it's a community planning process. We do some design, we go back to see if we got it right. We experiment with use, we go back to the design, we go, you know, it's, it's not chaos, but it's certainly much more circular and iterative than a traditional design process like the university is probably undertaking for designing its new facilities, but they can use that too, because we've done a lot of work with universities of this sort of um, loop back with their faculty, with their students, with the administration, and with the community. So we have a lot of partners out there looking at place and placemaking. Um, we work a lot with historic preservation. We're actually going to Portland on um, Sunday, we're doing uh, placemaking training for Main Street managers from five states funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National Main Street Center to kind of integrate placemaking into Main Street. Um, we do a lot of work with transportation, roads, transit facilities, um, markets, local food systems. So these are the sort of confluence, you know, place has a, has a role to play in, in all of these different disciplines. And these are also partners that you can look to work with other kinds of um, you know, climate change and re resilience. Uh, public health is a, is a big one. Public health funds a lot of our transportation work because we want to get people out walking and biking and active living. And so the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta help us do you know, right-sizing street design projects for communities because that means people will get out of their cars and walk a bit more. So communities today, Isla Vista is like this. You have all of these amazing assets. We saw them on the map. I don't have the beach or the ocean on here because you're super lucky in that way. You have that. And if you think about the white space, it's kind of the way these things are kind of not quite connected. And then you think about how the public realm, the public spaces, your trails, your bike paths, your bike ways, your, you know, all these different non-motorized ways you can get around, how you kind of link these things together so we're gonna we want to do like a connectivity exercise um, with you also about and these things can be physically linked together and they can be programmatically linked together and visually linked together so here's an example of a programmatic linkage between um, a museum and a hospital so we were at a library library museum hospital we were working in Richmond British Columbia which is near Vancouver and we were working with the library, and in the library they had an art gallery, uh, which was lovely. And across the street was a hospital. And at our public meeting, the hospital administrator came, met the head of the library, and basically said, you know, we are a community that is growing immensely, a huge influx of older Chinese population, just emigrating to Canada. A lot of older people from, from China. And the health practitioners were saying, you know, this particular population has a very high prevalence of diabetes. So we are seeing a huge influx of a population with a specific health challenge. We don't know how to reach these people. We don't know how to tell them about diabetes prevention. We don't, we don't know how to, we need a quarter of a million dollars for a huge public service you know, effort to, to get these people to come to the hospital. And it's, you don't understand, people in Asia do not go to the hospital to, they, like you, they go to the hospital because you failed them. They go to their medical professionals to keep them well. So the library director said, well, you know, we have this art gallery in the library, and every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, we have Chinese calligraphy class. And every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, we have a wonderful instructor who speaks four different dialects, and we have about 75 of your target audience right in our library. So every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, doctor and nurse come across the street from the hospital to the library, to the art gallery, and they open up the conversation about who's feeling well. If you're not feeling well, here we are. Come talk to us, this is information, and they do their diabetes workshop before the Chinese calligraphy class. 
no quarter of a million dollars, no big public service, just people talking to each other to, to understand, to go where the people are that you want. People do not come to you, they do not go to meetings at seven o'clock downtown, but you go to the Martin Luther King Festival or you know parades and so going to where the people are. So that was a very long explanation, but I just, isn't that, that's like an odd combination. So that's how we're thinking how you, how you can multi-use leverage the programming. And we're always talking about these institutions turning themselves inside out. You have a lot of parks, you have a lot of great public space, you have a lot of great institutions, and you need to kind of create that very permeable membrane of indoor, outdoor. These doors should open up, and we should, you know, having this whole, just indoor, outdoor, you've got fabulous climate, thinking outside the building. So what makes a great place? This is also in another one of your diagrams on your table. I'll just go through these. Um, just We'll talk more about this later, but when you think about, okay, she's talking about placemaking, what is a place? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like philosophy about place. There's the genus loci, you know, a place is sort of this kind of spiritual, um, connected attraction that you have to a physical environment. It's also a point, you know, on the map. So place is is a lot of different things. It's not just physical, and it's but it's also you know, very kind of emotional. So what is a great place? So this is after like 25 years of work, we came up with one diagram that kind of says it all. Great places have basically four major qualities, and you talked about them in your exercise. They have uses and activities. They have things happening. There's programs. There's events. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're large. Sometimes they're very local, sometimes they're more international, but there's stuff to do there. They have amenities, they're comfortable. Um, you know, we, we say that there's basically four things you need in a public space to make it, really, to make it success. You need a place to sit. You need a place where you can get out of the weather if you need to. You need access to food. You need access to the internet and something to look at or that's going on in the space. So we are not great on your amenities in your parks. You don't have a lot of physical amenities or flexible or movable amenities so that people could bring their own games. You can say, bring whatever you want, bring your own lawn chairs. People will do that if they know that that's the character. We just bring you know, the beach ball out of our backyard and we just go do that. Um, but the amenities to make it comfortable and to make it comfortable for people with kids or older people to spend time there. Very, very, very important. Um, access and linkages, these places need to be connected to each other. You know, walking through this, you know, fabulous little paseo here, you know, that's, but it's connecting destinations. So these destinations need to be linked up. And sociability is where you have people taking ownership over a place, um, bringing their Aunt Edna there when she visits from Boise, you know, because it's like a really cool place. But you also need people in a community that love a place enough to actually think about what activities, what amenities, and how to connect it to other destinations. So it always it begins and ends with people. This does not have to be big, long-term, or expensive. Um, you can create amazing places with exactly what you have here today. So, for example, bus stops, and now we know there was an Amtrak station near Santa Barbara. Um, this is a train station in, um, in New Jersey, and all of these businesses here that you see used to be on Main Street, but they relocated over here because the foot traffic was better, and the transit agency partnered with them and built out the space under the trestle. This is now like the best, this is their new Main Street that happens to be tied to a train station. So people go to the train station because it's got great ice cream and a children's clothing store. They may never get on a train, but that's okay. These facilities are, are portals to communities. This is a project we did like 20 years ago in Los Angeles um, after a riot. Okay, is that 30 years ago? Oh my God, no, 20. Okay. Um, this is North Hollywood, uh, Lancashire Boulevard. Uh, the, orange, the, re the red line is up here, the orange line, the buses are over here, but this is way before then. So this was your typical amenity package for your transit rider. <laughs> Stick in the ground, overflowing trash can, right. chain link no fence next to a vacant lot. Let's take the bus. You know, that's such an exciting <laughs> thing. Um, so this was what this is when the redevelopment agency still existed. Um, Lillian Birkenheim, Angel Guardian Angel. Uh, so they had this. They had a name, the NoHo North Hollywood Arts District. 
So step one um, was the one thing that all of the impacted communities had who experienced the riots was they all had very high transit ridership. So one of the first things that they did was to give everyone really nice bus shelters, at least to make that transit experience a little better. So here we have, this is our site, we got a new bus shelter. Uh, the fence came down because the redevelopment agency was approached by the North Hollywood Arts District that said, hey, we're a new arts district. Can we use this plaza to advertise theater and upcoming events and we'll keep it clean and nice for you? So they said, sure. So for a dollar a year, you know, the redevelopment agency let the North Hollywood Arts District use this space. So all of a sudden you have no chain link fence, a little, this is a sense of management that someone is taking care of this site. So you have, this took them in about six months. The funny thing happened is that the businesses started opening up, putting outdoor displays, staying open later at night, painting their facades. A Starbucks moved in, which 20 years ago was like a big deal, um, for this little place. Then the redevelopment agency convinced Pit Fire Pizza to actually buy this building and they put in this outdoor cafe here. They punched a wall through this outdoor garden, which they take care of. This is our bus stop. Then they even put in a little cappuccino espresso cart outside. Because this is public land, you can sit here without buying anything. So you can, and this is the bus stop. You know, well, this was a few years ago. So all of a sudden, this is now the gateway to North Hollywood. The Academy of Arts and Letters moved in. Um, there's like a new photography school that moved in. Then it's the gateway to the new to the red line and the orange line. We think it was just one bus stop that did all of it, but it was. <laughs> it was a transit agency, the redevelopment authority, um, a local arts group, and a private property owner. There are 38,000 bus stops in Los Angeles County. If you just focused on nothing but the bus stops, you could transform the entire county. So those are those, but it would look different probably at every bus stop. But that's how you kind of can really extrapolate and move further out. Another opportunity is Main Street. This is in Indianapolis. This is a, the, the very first urban bike trail. It's a cultural trail. It's a bike trail that takes you past all the cultural institutions in Indianapolis and out to the neighborhoods. Um, and this is a project that we did with Vassar College a number of years ago. Vassar College is in Poughkeepsie, New York. And this was their main street. And you know, they have, I don't know, 25, 30,000 students. It's a private college. It's not quite Ivy League. I think they wish they were Ivy League. Um, I went to Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. They didn't want to work with me. They wanted my colleague Steve because he went to Williams. So there was an attitude <laughs> thing happening. So, but this is their really kind of 1950s, 1960s looking downtown. Two lanes of traffic in each other. So you have university here, student housing over here, running back and forth, trying to do that. So this was a partnership with Vassar, the community, the business association, and the New, New York Department of Transportation who own that road. So they wanted to connect Vassar to their neighborhood, to their district. Mm -hmm. um, when I went there for the interview for the job, we were walking past into the gates of the campus and there were these homes along the side of the road with a lot of cars up on blocks. These were cars that had no tires, the engine had been pulled out, you know, people were repairing their cars and the woman I was talking to, she was leading me, and she goes, you know, we just, we just really want to build a really high fence so that our students and their parents don't see these poor people in their cars up on blocks. And that's when I said, whatever I was going to charge you, I'm quadrupling it right now. <laughs> so that was it. We want to like, they're an eyesore. So this was how you, you know, you know the story. I'm going to, now the New York State DOT also had goals, which was kind of improve the situation for pedestrians and vehicles. Um, making that road, you saw more of a downtown Main Street um, and improving access from the college and neighboring residential areas because there was parking. So this is kind of this wonderful little image we have here, like the Vassar College thing, and wide sidewalks, crosswalks, um, you know, upgraded facades, and this was kind of the vision that we sketched out with them. And we looked at some key locations, and a lot of it had to do with the gateway coming off of a state road, very fast traffic into this neighborhood. 
Um, so this is it before, and here you're like, uh, and then this is kind of after. And as you can see, we widened the sidewalks. We put in really nice. They put in really nice light fixtures. This is paid for uh, by by DOT, and I could get you more information. Probably a, a lot. You always have to aggregate the money. It comes from a lot of different pots. Um, and just kind of making this <coughs> an easier crosswalk and kind of the slowing the car so that when they get down here, it's actually one lane, putting in the splitter island. And this was just to really connect both sides of the street together. So this was sort of a traffic engineering strategy towards placemaking and economic development. This is an elementary school. So here it is before. Here's your bus. So you've got like lots of kids running across the street. So this was just... How do we slow people down? It's not you want to frustrate the drivers. You just want to redress the imbalance of roadway space and priority away from motorists and give it to pedestrians. So that means this, that one. Yeah. Um, this was, so a part of this, um, at one point we got this frantic phone call um, that Vassar, well, there was a couple of buildings that um, were being sold and we were trying to get Vassar to, to buy them just to buy the building so that it didn't become another liquor store, pawn shop, or tattoo parlor. I have nothing against tattoos, but there's you know there's a saturation point, and they and the building was going for sale. And we called. We said, "Dad, you just have to you just buy this building. Buy this building. You can flip it. You can rent. You develop it. But we have to we have to start getting control back over these businesses on Main Street to create more of that kind of Main Street community college sort of feeling. You can't just let the free market decide." what it's going to be. And they went ahead and they built it. Um, so here we did a, a sidewalk widening. This is a facade improvement. And sort of opened the windows so there's outdoor cafes, changed the zoning so people can sit down on the sidewalk. Um, a lot, so a lot of this is kind of cosmetic. This built, we didn't make a lot of changes to Julia Cafe Billiards. But we'll, I think it's no longer billiards. I think that was one of the transformations. Mm -hmm. Um, again, sort of wide sidewalks, curb, just to slow the speed of traffic. Cars get through much more actually effectively and easily if everyone is going 30 miles an hour rather than some people are going 45 and some people are going 20. Um, and then roundabouts. Um, you have them, the entrance to the 101 from Carpenteria. Um, you know, these, these roundabouts are amazing gateways. So this is the entrance to college, to, the, to Vassar College. This very beautiful gateway just, again, it just changes people's mindset that they know they're coming into a Main Street, a downtown, a community. They're going to be pedestrians. They're going to be cyclists. They have to behave differently. So this is really about changing driver's behavior and public perception. More crosswalks, more splitter that, a splitter islands, all throughout. And then even leaving town. This is like your way out of town. It was a very sort of off the rack, nondescript street. But you start letting people know, hey, we're coming into someplace special, why you have the protected bike lane and the rumble strip. So this also alerts drivers that in a mile or so, they're going to actually get to their destination or they know where, where Vassar is. Okay. Uh, impacts. Traffic delays decrease. Traffic speeds decrease. Crashes decrease. Traffic reduced because people were walking and biking more. More business, more people, more bikes. So that's just one Parks, we're just talking about Providence. This is Burnside Park in Providence. This was one of our Southwest Airlines funded projects, Frederick Law Olmsted Park. Um, we were working with sort of the Parks Department and they were doing a lot of children's programming here. And they said, why are you doing children's programming here? And they said, because if we have kids downtown, it'll make the office workers feel safer. <laughs> because they had an issue that when you got out of jail, you got a bus ticket and the bus transfer center was right here and you got to meet up with your peeps and your posse and start all over again. So if we have kids down here, the office workers will feel better. So they were doing all kinds of wonderful programs. Um, you know, kids don't need a lot of stuff. They like like cardboard boxes, full of them. Um, kids yoga. So they did a lot of heavy family programming on Thursdays. It was family yoga, it was reading time, it was a farmer's market, and then a beer garden in the afternoon. And so they had music, performance as well, movable seating, lots of families, lots of kids, I think might be on the weekend, but you never know who's actually living. People come, they will drive 45 minutes here. If you do like um, 
zip code checks. You're like, oh, it's, no one lives in this neighborhood. It's like, no, they're 45 minutes because this is such a great place to want to come to. They have the farmer's market here, the food trucks as well. Um, and there's part of a long-term plan that we're working on with them as well. So, and there's more that we've done there. So these are like these evolutionary kinds of things. Plazas and squares, this is historic. Chavez Park in San Antonio, Texas. The 1980s, they kind of did infrastructure, beautification, they put the walls here. And you know, no one is in this park because there's nothing to do. So you look at these folks, these guys, and you're like, they could just be having lunch, hanging out. They're not a gang, they're not a threat. But because there's no other people there and there's no other activity, your initial perception is they're probably up to some no good. And it, it might not be that way at all. It's they're up to a lot of great stuff. They're having fabulous philosophical discussions, but the context isn't designed to support that. So, you know, you've got a lot of overgrown plantings here and a lot of things it's like we're gonna design it and build it and never maintain it. Nothing needs maintenance. Low maintenance, no maintenance. Everything's everything needs to be maintained. So this is the after. So this was um, limbing up trees, adding different kinds of seasonal plantings. Um, this is it from my, well, this is it before. Um, you know, just a lot of overgrown, a lot of bare spots here, but just like nowhere to really, the benches, I love that. When you put the benches on the outside of the park facing the street, they have this in, um, <laughs> where was our, oh, in New Mexico, Santa Fe, and they're a wonderful, beautiful little square, right? All the benches are facing outward, not in. So this is just stupid, really stupid. Um, and then this was the app, this was the day it opened. The benches are still there, but they added more trees. And, and then sort of as the day evolved, we brought out, oops, we brought out all the furniture. So this again, they wanted places to sit. Um, so this was the movable furniture that we helped them buy. This is set up for a fundraising dinner. So this is genius. Um, so the Parks Foundation, Open. This was another Southwest Airlines project. The day of the opening, they had this. The night of the opening, they had this. Because we only gave them about eighty-five thousand dollars. So they're like, "Look what we did with eighty-five thousand dollars!" Everybody here, write a check. <laughs> so this was their promotion for their next fundraising activity. Which I just thought was very cool. Here we are, years before doing the planning and design at a meeting in the park and coming up with rendering. So we were in the park doing the planning. You cannot do the planning from 20 miles away. You have to be in the space and see how it works. This is our little rendering, and this is what we ended up doing, and this is this wonderful little cart where you can check out, you know, chess pieces and badminton and books, and there's a staff person who's there who puts out the tables and chairs every day and back on cops there brings these, you know, and you don't do this all day, like if it's not early, in early in the morning, there's no one there, so from 10 to 2, you do this stuff from 10 to 2, and then maybe from 4 to 6, and then maybe you don't do the weekend, and then maybe you expand it, and then maybe you do do the weekend, so you, you don't say we've got to keep this thing managed and open from 6 a.m. to midnight from the beginning, you put this stuff out when there are people there, who would use it, office workers, who would use it, kids after school, who would use it, people that want to hang out while the traffic dies down. So they can, you know, so who are the potential users of the space? What would it take to attract them? And what are the physical features you need to make it comfortable for them to be there? And of course, a lot of food trucks. <laughs> They're into food trucks. Public markets, so um, this might be for the, for the um, IV food co-op. This is in beautiful Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which in June 2008 <laughs> was completely flooded off the face of the planet. This was kind of, oh, here it is, this is where it was. That was the flood. Um, so the mission of the Nouveau, New Bohemian is the neighborhood, is provide a central meeting place, create new jobs, stimulate small business development. Oh, oh, and also provide easy, accessible venue to obtain food. Like the food was the last thing. That was their goal. Was all these other things were the first goal. And oh, by the way, we provide fabulous food was number, was number four. Um, so this is the building before. This is the neighborhood, the New Bohemian City neighborhood, market neighborhood. Here we are doing a little place evaluation game before. Um, this is the reopening of a new market structure, 18,000 foot um, market hall. Everybody obviously had to wear red blazers <laughs> that day, not really sure, it's a red blazer day. Um, open, come see us, great food and other treats. It has 21 permanent tenants, 
28 temporary spaces, it has seating, it has a special, it, there's music, so it's not just about buying and shopping, but if you are getting prepared food, you can sit and eat and there's something going on, you can learn how to play the banjo. They have family fright night, this was for Halloween. Um, trick or treating around the market, kids costume contest, outdoor pet costume contest, games and crafts, and then rooms. And bring your own pillows. Like, we don't have money for furniture. Bring your own stuff from home. We know you have it. So you, don't have to bring, you don't have to supply everything. You just create the venue and tell people to bring their own blanket. Um, they have special events outside. Very important. And at night as well, big concert. Concert. But then there's also had this impact on the neighborhood around it. Um, this was it sort of historically. Um, but it is now a center for cutting edge art, young artists. So this is the market district. The market created the energy and the synergy for the adaptive reuse of the Cherry Building, which is next to the market. So it had this spin-off effect, and the market and this Cherry Building has some new art venues and art galleries. So this stuff doesn't didn't happen in two days. You know, it took it took a couple of years probably, but it just has this wonderful outward ripple effect. Um, that it's always about what they talked about, equity and, and entrepreneurship and arts and culture. And it started with a new market. And it gets visited by very famous people, including Bill Clinton. What a cool place. He's so brilliant. All right, so there's Bill. Anyway, never mind. Let's keep going. Uh, waterfronts. Waterfronts. Um, so Cedar Rapids. So water, and this is a neighborhood in um, an island in Detroit. So some of these are... You have to think about scale a little bit here. This, a lot of this was funded by the Kresge Foundation. Um, this was sort of this beautiful peninsula that no one was going to. So here they have their Power of Ten um, aquarium. There's a conservancy. There's a zoo. There's the White House. There's a casino. There's fields. There's Sunset Point. There's a memorial fountain. Hmm. These are their activity areas. Bike rentals, yoga, games, guided tour, art class, food trucks, kayak rentals, and park cleanup. So they have the yoga, the aisle, kayak rentals. You know, you're on this lake, and they, so this is a small business, and it also gets people out on the water as well. Uh, children's programming, food trucks, and bike rentals. <laughs> Combining these things together, again, you have to like, so the food truck is there and the bike rental is there so you can rent your bike and get lunch. Always co-locate things. Always co-locate them. They have a beer garden, which is really fun. This is probably go over very big. Um, but it can be specialty as well. They have the sand volleyball court. You know what I noticed at that? There's no beach volleyball. I don't know. Oh, it is. There. Uh, no, it's in Santa Barbara. You know, but it's kind of that. The beach is all the way down there, and there's water. But you can have a beach up above, and maybe this oh bluff becomes more of a beach. I don't know. Like for this activity, because it's beach for beach related to beach. We like doing beach group activities. This looked like us about 20 minutes ago, and Nikki was taking us through our exercise, games, amenities, etc. Um, libraries. This was a project we worked on in Fort Myers, which is a small town in um, Florida. Lee County Public Library was locating downtown. They said, "Okay, this is our site. We own this." We own this. We own these two parking lots. This will be the library. This will be the parking. And we're like, okay, cool. We're like, well, what's this? Oh, that's like an 850 space vacant parking garage. Okay. And we said, what's this? Well, this is like a 60 spot. You know, this is around a church. This is around a church. This is church parking. And we're like, so when is the church is busy? They're like on Sundays. And what happens the rest of the time? There's no parking. Like, well, you know what? What if you didn't build parking? What if you took this whole thing and this became the library campus and you thought of this as one contiguous space and we wanted them to buy that and you know, do some other things? So that was like mind bending. And their county commissioner, because this was Lee County, was like, whatever we do back here is better than parking. Parking is incredibly expensive to build. Surface parking spaces cost about $10,000, structured parking costs about $35,000 a space. And underground parking is about forty-five to fifty thousand dollars a space. And so if you tell a developer they don't have to build parking, they can actually give in lieu funding to the to the community, to the city. It's like we're gonna save all this, but you don't have to build parking. But give us 
all or most of the money that you would have spent on parking so we can use it on public space improvements. Um, you can do shared parking as well. But yeah, parking should be regulated like a utility. In some communities it is, but it's like water and sewer and electrical. Parking is not a God-given right, not in the Constitution. Um, so, but people treat it that way. But it needs to be managed and it needs to be clear. So, we're like, no parking, they're like very excited. Um, so, and we had wonderful architects who actually let us design the public spaces before they designed the footprint of the building. So this was our north oh. building. This was here the kids play area because there was this great live oak tree that's like, oh, that is the story time tree. So we're like, story time tree, cool, great, okay, children's reading room here, open the door. Children's librarian can just like reel the books out and have the story time tree. So we started with the activity, outdoor story time, and figured out program of the building, children's library here, and then design the building, open doors. Um, then this is sort of a main street, and we're like, well, people are going to look by, so where do you put, you know, there's always the periodical reading room. We're like, let's put it front here so people walking by the street can see people reading the newspaper, reading a magazine, make that very visible. So this was sort of the daytime office worker, come here, have lunch, get a book, check your email because you can't do it in your office, sort of work week sort of area. And then the back 40 was more of the weekend family community activity event space. You could use it for parking, symphony, shuffleboard, games. And this was to remain uh, pretty much sort of, an, of, a, of a flexible green space. So here we are under construction. Here's our building. This was our little green space parking. That's like a staging area. And here it is open. This is that building. And we but it's not a great shot and we have like outdoor read there's a story time tree and of mm -hmm. course being behind chairs and it was like a literary themed opening so this can happen government buildings um this is denver colorado where the timothy mcveigh trial was oklahoma city bomber this is what we're going to keep that those trucks out with these planters those geraniums were going to like you know fight terrorism and after that was like let's just redesign this whole space so it's really much more comfortable for the people that come here and work here, et cetera. But just think Vancouver School Board is like in the downtown Main Street over Death by Chocolate. Like why do our municipal buildings have to be in some like tower in a field or in some office complex somewhere? Why can't we integrate these municipal services like into the core of our downtown? Plus if the building is vacant, they can pay rent. They can always move out if you get a better offer, but just thinking about those kinds of buildings. Um, and these are markets. This is in Prague, and this is in Oaxaca, Mexico. Government office is here, government office is here, market here, great public space. Mm -hmm. So the city offices are located actually over the market or in around the great public space. There. Churches, I'm almost done. Uh, this, is in, this is also in Mexico where the church is sort of the center of that public space. This is Arvada, Colorado, where this is vacant six and a half days a week. And you know, that's it. That's that single purpose, single purpose institutions. Remember power 10, it goes for institutions, churches, libraries, museums as well. So this was a project, this was the Spirit Walk project we did in Trenton, New Jersey with the DOT and about a dozen different churches was to create this safe, take back the streets, healthy walking path, connecting all these religious institutions to one another and turning them into destinations. So um, this was the green space they had and they had a canal and we said, well, look, you know, this is in another community that has a canal. What if you turned it around? You could actually sit there. What if there were benches? You know, we just kind of looked at, you've got this big parking lot. Why don't we put a market in it? You have this place across the street. Maybe it could be a children's playground. So we often try to find examples that look similar to the situation again. Um, and this was kind of their plan for the Shiloh Baptist Church was to create this sort of green space, exercise space as well. Um, to change the street so that people would actually feel comfortable walking and going down to the Delaware River, kids play structure, picnic benches, outdoor concerts after church, um, using the parking lot for other kinds of programs. Again, turning this fabulous institution inside out. Cultural institutions, okay, just because you have like in traditional city halls like Santa Rosa, they have the city hall and they have the library and the museum and they're all around these beautiful Square does not mean that those institutions ever talk to one another, ever, never, no. 
and it doesn't, it's just not, but even though they serve all of us at different times of our lives. So this is Logan Circle in Philadelphia. There is an Alexander Calder senior sculpture here and like six lanes of death-defying traffic to action. Yeah. So when people, when people put public art in a traffic island, I want to shoot them. <laughs> this is like before, you know, this is like a major, unbelievably valuable work of art, and it is just like imprisoned, surrounded by traffic. So this was an underutilized asset, and all of these institutions around it were underutilized. Um, there was the library, the court, cathedral, the Franklin Institute, and we did this place-making sort of exercise with them and basically said, we're all inside of our buildings because of the amount of roadway, not traffic so much, but the amount of roadway space that's in front of us. So we said, well, what if we nibbled back on the road and created more front yards for all of your organizations? So the idea was the free library would have an outdoor reading room and a playground so that when families at the family court needed a break or the kids were getting, you know, there was like things happening and the family was, was distressed, they could come over here the kids can blow off steam and get married at the cathedral, and then your family stays at the Four Seasons, um, the Franklin Institute, the Moore College of Art. So it was really about creating more space, taking away the space for the cards and giving it back to these institutions, which were much more valuable assets than just roadway. We say that 70 to 80 percent of the public space in any street, in any city or town, are streets and roads. Whoever controls the streets and roads has all the toys and they win. So we're always looking at nibbling back because that's our public space. And why should it just be, you know, just to store or move automobiles? So some of this was the before, this is a little hard, but we added, again, this is traffic engineering to create place and cultural play and creative place making. Just easier ways to get into this park, taking out a couple of lanes of traffic, you know, just connecting this. All of this striping you see is like that, that can be reclaimed. This is how it looked. Um, so it just made it much more permeable. And then adding amenities and seating and flower plantings. And then when you graduate from the Moore College of Art with a master's in sculpture, you get to do an outdoor exhibition mm -hmm. you know, for the summer. So the MFA class gets to use this space. The Philadelphia Museum is up the road. They had never done any sort of outdoor uh, display or of their exhibition before we worked to change the design of the traffic circle down the road. Then they started opening themselves up as well. Okay, I will end. I'm sure you're excited. <laughs> I end. This is William White, our founder and mentor in Craze of Small Spaces. We're talking a lot about small spaces. The multiplier effect is tremendous. Covered that. It's not the number of people using them, the number, large number who pass by. But I love this, the larger number of people who feel better about their community and their city center for knowledge of them, even if they don't go there. I love the Ivy Food Co-op. I have never been there. I've never been, I love it. I love the city because you've got a food co-op. Like those amazing spaces that make people really proud of their community, even if they don't happen to go there very often, but they exist. So they're priceless, whatever the cost. They're built of a set of basics. Um, and they're right in front of our noses, if you will look. So what we're gonna do after lunch is look at the, the basics that are right in front of our noses. And we're gonna leave this light up because Holly White was a genius. Are there any questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so looking at uh, the major transi transitions in like the Vassar College slide and um, also the North Hollywood bus stop, one thing that I thought about is how do we balance like, if you have any thoughts on how to balance the need and benefits of redevelopment with the threat of gentrification, it's like taking areas where there are many low-income people mm -hmm. and uh, making them much nicer, but still not kicking them out. Any thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's some, an issue that we're dealing with all the time, um, and there's no easy answer to it. Um, a lot of it has to do with the public will and the community will and the political will to to allow for people to stay in their homes because no one needs to live, you know, there's a community in Queens, it's like, we don't want you to clean up the Gowanus Canal, which is a brownfield site, because if you clean it up, then we won't be able to live here anymore. It's like, but you're living in an environmentally toxic place. It's like, we don't care because we can afford our homes. Like that is an insane scenario. Um, so there's a lot of different philosophies about it, but it's really about how do we create a place where the newcomers value and respect the residents that are there, contribute 
use their funding and their money and their and their dollars to support additional businesses that also benefit local people? How do we put plans in place, whether it's rent control or other kinds of financial incentives to developers? If you buy affordable housing, if you keep these tenants in the building, we will speed your permitting. We will, you don't have to build parking. We will give you incentives. Um, and it's the community and the developers um, and the political folks kind of working together to have those conversations early on, really before things, before things happen. Um, and it's a lot of like documenting what is actually there, but it's, it's about valuing the narrative, valuing the people who live in the community having a voice and saying, you know, we are staying and this is who we are and you're welcome to come in, but this is a completely Latino business district. So if you're a Latino business owner, please move in. But if you're Starbucks, you know, you're not really welcome here. We need you to go somewhere else because this is kind of our, our space. So part of this process is to help people feel like they have that voice, to have those conversations, and it's not, it's not easy. So. One thing I would like to add to that, uh, it's important to give incentives, like Cynthia said, but it's also important to in some way regulate those incentives because a large part of what Holly White was studying when, you know, before PPS even started in the 70s was, uh, New York City was giving incentives in terms of you could build more floor, uh, floor space if you actually had a public space underneath your buildings. So developers started doing that left and right, but that doesn't mean that those public spaces outside of the building were being used because there was no control or regulation or guidelines to how to actually create an active and vibrant public space at the ground level. No, that's not what they cared about. They all, all they cared about was we can build two more floors if we leave X, Y, Z amount of square foot down at the ground floor. So it's very important that your community comes into that process and they tell you, yeah, it's great, you're giving us the space, but how about we have a class there every once in a week or something, you know, whatever would make, actually make that a vibrant public space instead of just, you know, space. Yes. So here I have a question about, um, I think it's the same kind of question. You know, I'm, I'm concerned about community members who, are, who don't have a voice and how you capture, you, you ensure that you capture everyone's voice. Mm -hmm. So Burnside Park in Providence is a really good example of this. It's like, I lived in Providence for 20 years and there's always been a lot of tension and conflict around Burnside Park because it's where a lot of people who do not have homes congregate. Mm -hmm. And so there's still controversy about Burnside Park in Providence because a lot of community activists would argue that that's an example of cosmetic gentrification. Mm -hmm. and that it's being made, it's being prettified, so that the people, that the other constituencies, like for instance, the, the plaza, you know, it's like RIPTA has an invest, deep investment, the transportation entity has a deep investment in cleaning that up, and the city has a deep investment in cleaning that up, and safety is paramount, and there's a lot of conflicting, I'm just wondering, so mm -hmm. the homeless are now gone from Burnside Park. No, they're not. Um, well, if you've seen it before, well, they're, they're Meantime, there used to be, you know, every year there'd be an opera, um, you know, that was for, for and being designed by homeless people. Wow. And so, you know, and, and, and a professor at Brown was going down and doing this every single year. It's not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering how you make sure, for instance, that community members whose voices typically are not heard, you know, are brought into this process, which is so rich and vibrant. <laughs> Well, part of it is you, you know, as I said earlier, you go to where the community is and you, um, I mean, we have materials here available in Spanish. You make sure that everything is translated. You make sure that you reduce the barriers to participation as much as you possibly can um, in terms of welcoming people to the conversation. We do do a, a lot of work with social service providers or with people that um, are working in that field who, who represent these communities. With all of our library work, there's always social service providers and, and social workers there because homeless people and people looking for jobs go to libraries. It's like the last democratic public space we have in our country um, to kind of meet people where, where they are. So in Burnside Park, there are still homeless people, but they are sort of like ambassadors. They like to watch the kids. They're um, they're, you know, they have their functionally, highly functional folks that are homeless for a variety of reasons. Um, but it is, you know, it's that, it's that, it's always about having the conversation, who's in the room and who's not in the room, and how to bring people to that, to that conversation. And then having folks that, 
work in those fields to, to be the bridge you know, to those communities that, that you want to reach to. Um, but it's a lot of work, but it's also a tremendous amount of benefit because you get all kinds of other amazing outcomes and resources um, that you never really thought of. So everybody has creativity, everybody is a resource um, to a certain extent, and it's how you tap into that. That's, that's part, of the, part of the fun of it. And, yeah. uh, and oh. one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow a little bit more is other tools that we use for reaching these people, because you know there's a lot of, you can do a little bit of canvassing, you can have just casual dialogues, you know, talk to them, what's going on, um, you know, do place making workshop in place, like not like this, not bring them in the room because they might not be comfortable. So going where to where they are. So there are all these other ways of reaching out to them. I guess the important thing about to remember about uh, Burnside Park, which is, you know, I agree, there's no right or wrong about gentrification. Anything can be labeled gentrification. But the key is the homeless people are still there. The difference is that they're not the dominant user group anymore. There are all these other people who are using the park. Whereas before, it was you know, just them. So it's kind of like um, combating the negative with the positive, not trying to remove the negative, but bringing in the positive so that you, you know, sort of the, um, you know, acupuncture way. Seed it with positive activity and the negative would slowly fade to the background. So, so we've done some evaluation of our, of our Burnside Park um, project because Southwest Airlines is a corporation after all. And they're like, we just gave them $85,000. So what are the outputs? So we've been wrestling with this, how do you measure the impacts of placemaking on things that are not just economic, but like health and environment and social. So around Burnside Park, um, we saw that uh, a, the largest percentage of the population earns under $25,000 a year, their annual income. Um, also a large population of renters, not homeowners. So we see this now functional, safe, clean, public space with programming. And we say, so we are benefiting people who live in apartment buildings, who don't have backyards, who don't have access to green space. And we're providing free activities for people who are lower income. The yoga class is free, the kids play is free, the reading room is free, the imagination center is free. So we're actually providing a benefit to the people who still live in this community, even if they're not that visible, but, they, but they're there. So there is this way of sort of showing that, that the value added of those investments and value added of the public space to, to the larger community that we're slowly kind of measuring. Um, and yeah. No, I just have a comment about, you know, I think it's shifting this mindset from ownership and kind of authorship to stewardship. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we have this responsibility beyond place making to actually steward our community, right? Be in the community. And, and so I, I feel like stewardship is really crucial to whatever's done. Right? You can have a beautiful plaza, but if it's not loved and taken care of by its community, you know. All right. Yes. Uh, that was actually directly related to my question. Uh, one of the unique parts about our community is there's a large rental, some would argue transitory type of thing going on where people come here for periods of time and then they leave. Yeah. And many of the people in the room represent kind of the people who stay, <laughs> frankly. Um, but we also interact with all the people who are coming and going. I was wondering if in any of your examples, you've seen something like that. I mean, I guess maybe the college atmosphere is part of it, but are there particular strategies you've seen when we walk out in our spaces this afternoon that we should be thinking about in terms of renter stewardship, renter ownership, mm -hmm. renters owning a place, even though they're renters. Yeah, so. good question. Yeah, um, yeah um, in a lot of university towns, certainly. Um, let me think. You know, one example is that where the people that graduate from university actually have an opportunity to open a business or a shop or create sort of an entrepreneurial work, shared workspace in the town where they went to school. I went to school in Worcester, Massachusetts. It is not Santa Barbara, it is not Isla Vista. It's a really, anyway, very challenging to see, but students, my friends grew up and they, they moved in, they bought the houses, it was very low rent, very inexpensive to buy, and they opened businesses there. Um, they did that in Ann Arbor as well because there's sort of this entrepreneurial incubation spirit within the university that says, if you've learned this, you can actually find a space, or there is a space that we're gonna create. Maybe the university helps co-create this, this incubator space where people can start a business or start a shop or start some sort of economic activity so that they actually sort of own a business here. So they, they stay after graduation, not just to serve. 
um, but to, to sort of start their careers. Um, you know, there's, I think, I think opportunities, and maybe this is where sort of the um, interface with the university, with community outreach and, and your labs and other things can sort of talk about um, how, the, how the university students can become part, more part of the community. Like I used to work at the food, food co-op, and we had a food co-op, and we had kids from the town that also worked in the food co-op, and we had families from the community in Maine, South, and Worcester who were members you know, of the food co-op. Um, we had a radio station that was also university plus the community. Um, so really alternative ways for kids to get involved. And I think we've been sort of talking about this. I was speaking to the sheriff earlier. It's providing the students with alternative things to do. Not every kid who comes here wants to get blasted, you know, every night of the week. But if there's nothing else to do and that's what their friends are doing, that's what they're gonna do. But if there's, you know, a coffee shop, if there's music class, if there's other, if there's a community gardening project, um, they'll they'll want to they'll want to do that. We used to also have Big Brother Big Sister at Clark, where my friends and I would just like join this. Pro we would adopt a high school student in town and bring him to the campus or take them shopping or to the, whatever they needed to do to get out of often very um, sort of dysfunctional, unhealthy home situations. So there was just this real focus of the university to actually support this very, very needy neighborhood in which they've been operating since 1887. So it could be university, Lehigh University. Um, so glad you asked. In Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Lehigh University is up on a hill. And then down below it is like the little international 4th Street, which has all these wonderful um, multi-ethnic restaurants and cafes and they're locally owned and then across the state highway is this is the Bethlehem Steel Stacks which is this amazing incredible building and facility and then there's art centers so every year the freshman year there's like an orientation week and they take every freshman on a walking tour of Bethlehem and they show them all these cool restaurants and where to shop where the supermarket is they take them across the street to the banana factory art center they take them around so that they know what other resources there are in the community. They meet merchants and businessmen, so they understand that they are actually new neighbors. Um, and not every person wants, not every university person wants to do this, but they've sort of made it something that they do during admissions, so that you actually go out and you meet Pegan and you meet some of the people in this room who've lived here a long time or who run a business, and they, so that they understand that they're being welcomed as new, as new neighbors and that they are citizens and kind of responsible. Um, in that in that regard, and there was something else about Lehigh University that they did. I really liked it. Um, well, they also have this really hysterical thing when the students leave every year, like whatever last day of class is, and I think the university organizes this. So you know, the dorms are full of stuff. Kids leave stuff. They leave furniture. They leave clothing. They leave stuff. So the university has to pay to get rid of the stuff. They have this. I don't know exactly how it works, but this giant sort of I don't, you know, like, not even yard sale. It's just the people from the community go to this campus. They go to this place on campus where all the stuff has been gathered from the, and they just get to take things. It's like a huge rummage sale. We have that here. You do. Fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. So you do that already. So that's good. <laughs> and it's it. So you know, there's just anyway. But I'm digressing. Um, so it's it's letting it's encouraging the student even through internships you know students do internships in the communities they work for a nonprofit they work for the health center they they have to do some sort of community service as part to get their bachelor's degree um, it's figuring out ways to kind of make them feel that they are responsible members of a community um, larger than themselves but um, may, I, may I add to that because sure. I think that what we're you know, this project as well as, as others and other planning efforts happening in the community, it's really taking a regional approach and many of these are really entrepreneurial or economic development plans. We're working on a countywide food action plan and you would think that's about food access, but in many cases it's really an economic development plan and how to have entrepreneur opportunities in the food system. So we start piecing together all these parts. Mm -hmm. Then there's those opportunities for, as you say, for the students to actually stay here and invest here. Um, and even if it's just for a period of time, even after college, and then they go on to something else. But it still gives them a, root, a rootedness here. And making that opportunity more than just in Isla Vista, but uh, really on a regional approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 